Okay, just a little heads up. The answer is no. <laughs> now, to uh, help me convince you of this fact, uh, I want to introduce you to uh, a researcher who is going to help me to illustrate some points. Coincidentally, his name is Andy too, so you can read into that what you will. I'm going to let him introduce himself. Is your name Andy? I don't know how to answer that. Simple yes or no. Well, everyone calls me Andy, but my full name is Andrew, I think. So, no? Wait. Yes. <laughs> so what I'm going to talk about are three things that can influence whether results are true. There are other things, but these are the things that I'm going to talk about. The first uh, are researcher degrees of freedom. The second is objectivity. And the third is competence. So starting off, first of all, with researcher degrees of freedom. And again, it's back to Andy. I'm going to say that there is at least a chance that I didn't think this through completely. So researcher degrees of freedom uh, comes into play, really, in terms of thinking ahead about what you're doing. So all research that you do, there are researcher degrees of freedom, and that is just a fact of life. So, for example, there was a study a couple of years ago where 29 teams of data analysts were given the same data and the same hypothesis to test, and they came up with a wide variety of different ways to test it. So, at the beginning of your research process, there will be lots of degrees of freedom in what you do. What outcome measures do you use? In my former life uh, researching child anxiety, if I want to do a study on child anxiety, there's about 15 different questionnaires I could use. I could use physiological measures, I could use behavioural tasks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have degrees of freedom when we're designing research studies. But I'm going to talk about where these degrees of freedom can become problematic. One of them is questionable research practices. And I've kind of split these two things because I, I, I sort of think, or the way I've lumped them together is really sort of deliberate attempts to manipulate your results versus what I've rather patronisingly called they know not what they do errors which I'm going to cover in the competence section. So assuming that you're going to test the hypothesis that you're interested in with null hypothesis significance testing, this is the framework that you're using, which I'm, I'm going to assume everyone's pretty familiar with it and not really go through it. Now, there are degrees of freedom that you're going to have right at the beginning. You're going to have degrees of freedom over what hypothesis you want to test, what predictions you want to make. You're going to have degrees of freedom over specifying the unique alpha that is appropriate for your research question, although, of course, no one actually bothers doing that. They just pick 0.05 because that's what everyone else does. But, theoretically, you have some degrees of freedom to pick an idiosyncratic alpha level, uh, which is going to feed into the sample size that you need to collect. And, of course, you're going to have degrees of freedom over the model that you're going to pick to test the hypothesis of interest. And, in particular, depending on what model you pick, that is going to affect what sampling distribution that model relies on to uh, test the hypothesis. That's kind of all fine. You know, it, like I said, it's a fact of life. There are degrees of freedom up here. Where degrees of freedom become problematic is after you start collecting data. So essentially, up here, not too bad. If you start operationalizing degrees of freedom over what you do uh, beyond this point, then your results are pretty much going to go to hell. Now, why are they going to go to hell? Well, it's to do with the fact that your p-value is a long-run probability. So it basically relies on the fact that you are setting up a study and you are computing a probability based on repeating that study kind of you know, an infinite number of times in an identical way. So if you start kind of messing around with things after you've started collecting data, then the p-value that comes out of SPSS or R or whatever you want to uh, choose to analyze your data is not going to reflect your original set of decisions. A very simple way to illustrate this is if you imagine a parallel universe that is identical in every single respect where you are doing a piece of research Everything is identical, so you've, you've set up your uh, original study, you've set up uh, everything about it in exactly the same way, you've done your power analysis and realised that you need, say, 100 participants. You start collecting data. In one of your parallel universes, you collect 100 participants. In the other parallel universe, for some reason, you decide, oh, I'll just collect 90, I can't really be bothered with the last 10. Now, you'll get different p-values in those two parallel universes. One of your p-values is encoding information not just about your hypothesis, it also has been contaminated by the decision you made 
to stop collecting data earlier. So the fact those p-values differ is because one of them has this has kind of been contaminated by what you have done, the decisions you've made. And you don't want your p-values contaminated by things that you have done. Because, you know, you want to know about your hypothesis, you don't want to know about things that you've done. So, first of all, questionable research practices. So these are things that are kind of maybe deliberate attempts to manipulate your data. So there was uh, a meta-analysis uh, published in PLOS, I think it was, a few years ago, which reviewed several papers that had asked scientists whether they engaged in particular kinds of questionable research practices. And they had to respond for themselves, which, as you might imagine, probably uh, maybe underestimates things a little. Uh, and they also had to uh, respond based on whether they had experience of other people doing these things, where you might expect people to be a bit more free uh, about admitting to this sort of thing. So what I've done is uh, actually, uh, this table is like the highest percentages reported. So this was uh, assimilating information from lots of studies. These are the highest percentages reported. So it's like the most extreme scenario. So in terms of actually just making up data, uh, about 4.5% of scientists admitted to doing that themselves, and about 60% admitted to knowing someone who had done that. In terms of selective reporting or dropping cases to benefit your analysis, Again, rates within individuals admitting it for themselves, it's like, you know, 15%-ish. Uh, but if you look at other people, again, for like selective reporting, it's unbelievably high. Uh, fitting multiple models and reporting the most favourable. So this again, this will be a researcher degree of freedom that's put into practice after the data are collected. About 45% said that they knew someone who had done it. Uh, terminating the study at some other time than when you plan to terminate it. So that's like the parallel universe example. About a third of people admitted to doing that themselves. And using inappropriate designs, and in this respect, this would be designs that kind of maximise your chance of demonstrating the thing that you want to demonstrate. Uh, again, about sort of 13-ish percent uh, admitted to doing it, and uh, about 40% said they knew someone who'd done it. So there's a lot of, you know, potentially there's a lot of this kind of stuff going on. And, you know, that's bad enough, but I, I kind of, I think it's maybe not quite so bad as the other things, which are like non-deliberate things which will also have uh, negative impacts. Go ahead and sting me, please. It does nothing. So, p-hacking. Now, p-hacking, I sort of think, is a, in a way, is a middle ground between deliberate, act, you know, nefarious activities and maybe non-deliberate nefarious activities. Um, because, like, in a sense... I, I sort of think people maybe do this without realising that it's a bad thing. I mean, there, there have been some cases recently of people more or less publicly admitting to p-hacking and then sort of being surprised when people go, you do know you're p-hacking, right? And that's a bad thing. And then, mm, OK, uh, didn't realise that was a bad thing. But I also think there's probably, you know, it deliberately, people deliberately p-hack. So what is p-hacking? It's basically taking your data and testing it to death to try and find something in there to report, and then creating some, you know, potentially creating some backstory as to why that's an interesting finding. Now, uh, this curve here is an example. There have been a few papers that do so-called p-curve analyses. There are, these analyses are problematic in various ways, but this is useful for just illustrating the point of what p-hacking might look like, although some people think it doesn't look like this at all. Um, the blue line represents the distribution of p-values you would expect to find, theoretically, and the orange dots represent the uh, distribution of p-values that you do find if, uh, I think this was, uh, this was published in QJP. I can't remember what journals it was uh, surveying, but I have a feeling it was uh, kind of Journal of Experimental Psychology type stuff. Anyway, so you can see the, the orange dots follow the theoretical distribution quite nicely, apart from at the critical value of 0.05, where suddenly there is a disproportionately high number of p-values at just below that threshold, almost as if people had been doing things to nudge their p-values below 0.05 to increase their chance of getting published. Like I said, though, there are, there are problems with this kind of analysis, but it just illustrates kind of what we mean. We're talking about people just doing lots and lots of studies until they find something cr creeping over the threshold of significance that they can publish. This might also, of course, reflect people deliberately manipulating uh, aspects of their analysis until their P sort of goes down. A related idea is uh, the idea of forking paths. In fact, um, it, if you read around, forking paths and P-hacking uh, are quite often used interchangeably. 
but I think there are subtle differences. So uh, the idea of forking paths is really about your data affecting how you analyze it. So there's two potential examples here. One is uh, you've made a prediction about something happening, and then uh, that prediction you know, doesn't seem to be supported by your data, but you're looking kind of at the means or whatever, or just looking at some sort of descriptive statistics, and you think, oh, well, hang on. When I, when I look at the men, the thing that I predicted seems to be happening, but in the women it doesn't. That's interesting, isn't it? And theoretically, that could also be interesting, because although I hadn't thought about it before, it does make sense that maybe I'd get this effect you know, in one sex but not the other. And so then you analyse it. So what you're doing there is you're doing effectively a post hoc analysis, but you're not controlling for the fact you're doing a post hoc analysis. So that's one example. Another example is the decisions you make having seen your data about the model you fit. So, oh, I've got some outliers. Do I trim them? Do I transform the data? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you haven't planned for that ahead of time, again, your p-value is reflecting the decisions that were made after the data were collected. And that's not what you want. So it's a bit like doing this. Because we're smart. <laughs> God, are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> Out of the way! Yeah! <laughs> uh -oh. ah, I call an ambulance! A different ambulance, the one I ran into! That's a kamikaze! <laughs> so you look around your data until one of the analyses makes you happy. Now, of course, you can avoid all of this if you uh, refer to good, high-quality statistics texts, like this one. <laughs> but also, I believe that a lot of these things would be helped by having independent analysts. So I've listed some of the things I've just talked about there and whether I think an independent analyst would help. Fabricating data, I mean, clearly. Selective reporting, I think they have a limited influence on, potentially, because I guess... But I don't know, if they're authored on the paper they presumably do have an influence because they could just say, well, you know, I don't want to be authored on this because you're, you know, you're selectively reporting what we did. Uh, obviously, if they're not authors on the paper, that becomes more tricky, but they probably should be authors on the paper if they're analysing the data. Um, things like dropping cases, terminating the study early, a lot of this, assuming the analyst is involved in the design uh, and all the decisions before the data is collected, then they are potentially you know, a policing force over other things. So I think at the very least, they would make changes transparent. Now, a lot of the reason for this is because they can be objective. So I have an anecdote here to uh, illustrate what I mean, and I want to make clear that this anecdote is not directed at the person who is involved in the anecdote. It is uh, intended as an illustration of the pressures that scientists are under and the kind of incentive structures that we have that you know, kind of promotes this kind of uh, Look, behavior. I found all three differences. Those are two completely different pictures. So can people be objective about their own data? Now, uh, being someone who writes statistics textbooks, I get emails from random people, quite a lot of them, in fact. And this is an example of one such email. So it's the story of Dr. X. So X wrote to me and said, some people have failed to replicate my studies. I think their analysis is flawed. Can you help? Would you be willing to say something public about this whole situation? This would be tremendously helpful. And I thought, well, probably not until I've had a look at the data. So I said, bearing in mind I had a lot of other stuff to do, uh, if you send me your data and their data, I'll give you my objective opinion. I thought that was quite a nice thing to do. Anyway, what my objective opinion turned out to be was, uh, this is from my email back, my view is, I'm sorry to say, that the between group effects are probably not real and the replicators are probably entirely justified in their conclusions. You certainly can't argue anything based on them applying an incorrect analysis. If they had, they would have reached the same conclusion only more strongly. That's just my opinion, right? And, you know, it's not like I was going to go out on Twitter and say this or anything. This was a private discussion between us. Um, but the response of X was this. Whilst it's true that my original study one was weak, there are two successful direct replications by independent researchers, and my collaborators and I have done a number of other successful studies. Like I give a shit. <laughs> so a rough translation of this is, although I respect your opinion enough to email you, unsolicited to comment on my data, I basically don't care what you think because it's not what I wanted to hear. P.S. I feel a strong need to convince you that I'm right. <laughs> now, I realise I'm, you know, I'm deliberately being very flippant about this, but the point I wanted to illustrate is people are under enormous pressure. We're all very personally invested in the research that we've done. It's a completely human response to respond in this way, because 
you know, it's, it's very uh, threatening to have people comment on your work, or it can be very threatening. And that's because the incentive structures in academia are essentially all wrong. Does an independent analyst help with this? Yes, because I think they can be objective. As this scenario shows, I wasn't the one who collected all of those data. I hadn't spent lots of time doing it. I hadn't invested emotionally in it. It was incredibly easy for me to draw that conclusion because I had no personal attachment to what that conclusion was. So finally, competence. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I know I'm doing it really, really well. <laughs> so do psychologists know what they're doing? Uh, so I want to use some... Actually, most of, the, most of these studies that I'm going to talk about I, are not particularly fabulous studies. They're just, again, illustrative. So um, actually, many years ago, there was a study by Oakes, and what he did was um, he presented some uh, academic psychologists with six statements about what the p-value represented. And all of those statements were wrong. But he was interested in how many people would endorse any one of them as being true. So they could endorse none of them or one or more. It, it, you know, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like a multiple choice. It was just you know, which ones of these are true. And he found about 97% would endorse at least one incorrect statement. So this was repeated more recently, uh, but the sample was split into methods and structures, uh, si research active psychologists who didn't teach methods, and psych students. 100% of the psych students had at least one misconception about the p-value, which is not remotely surprising, because these poor souls are being taught by these people, <laughs> and 80% of them had misconceptions about the p-value. And uh, the, uh, the psychs not teaching methods, uh, it was about 90% of them. What about confidence intervals? Uh, this was a study in site methods a while back. So uh, basically, it was an online study. People were presented with this image of a confidence interval. And this confidence interval, they could drag up and down. So it was like a, an online applet. And they were asked to drag this confidence interval to the point where its overlap with the other confidence interval represented a p-value of 0.05. Now, this diagram shows the correct position. So this is what people should have, well, where they should have dragged it to. And the dotted lines are sort of uh, what, they, what the authors considered a reasonable margin of error around that. Now, uh, in terms of who, you know, so if we assume anything outside of these dotted lines is kind of wrong, if you like, and anything within dotted lines is broadly correct, um, I'm going to make this easy for you. The reds are the people who got it wrong. So the vast majority, oh, sorry, this is psychologists, behavioral neuroscientists, and medics. So the vast majority of people couldn't do this task particularly well. So, again, illustrates that research active scientists in these disciplines are not particularly aware of what the relationship between, say, a confidence interval and a p-value is. What about, say, assumption testing? Now, broadly speaking, I'm, I'm picking this in particular because there's a bit of research sort of attached to it. So, uh, if we look at the linear model and if we look at um, you know, the, the situation where essentially we're assuming a normal sampling distribution, P-values and confidence intervals will depend upon that sampling distribution being normal. Now, Will, Rand Wilcoxon's, uh, Wilcox, I always do that. Rand Wilcox in the States has done a load of research showing that when uh, distributions have heavy tails, so this means there's slightly too many scores in the sort of extreme ends of the tail of the distribution, basically it creates problems for power. And uh, in experiments where you've got multiple groups, if those groups are unequal, how it affects power is very, very unpredictable. He's also shown that although theoretically we'd expect sampling distributions to be normal in samples bigger than 30, actually, with these heavy tail distributions, our samples might need to be much bigger before we can just assume that the central limit theorem kicks in. If you look at what psychology data looks like, uh, about two-thirds of it has heavy tails, at least in this study, which, again, I know is a little bit old. If you look at things like heteroscedasticity, again, biases confidence intervals, but that's not a problem particularly because there are ways to estimate standard errors around parameters in models that compensate for degrees of heteroscedasticity. So, you know, it's, it's not particularly a problem, but you need to adjust for it. So do people adjust for these things? Uh, again, this is not a particularly great piece of science or anything, but they, uh, look, they gave 30 researchers six data sets that, you know, um, and basically just kind of coded the process they went through to analyze them. And essentially, uh, only 12% of that sample correctly looked at normality. Uh, I mean, a, a few others had a go, but got it wrong. Um, and only about 22% correctly uh, checked out heteroscedasticity. 
and a couple of other studies by Osborne, uh, just looking at whether pub, uh, you know, research in published journals reports looking at assumptions of the models that are being fitted. Uh, in educational psychology journals, it's about 8.3%. Now, it doesn't mean they're not doing it, but they're certainly not reporting it, and that is kind of important information. Uh, and again, in APA journals, it's a fairly low number who are reporting checking distributional assumptions. Now, why might this be? Well, a thing that a lot of people say to me when they're uh, analysing data or asking me about this thing is, yeah, but ANOVA's robust. So is it robust? Well, there are people in the world, many of them, who know a lot more about statistics than I, and I sought one of them out, the baby of statistics, who lives in the woods near my house, under a tree. <laughs> So I went out there one day using a little map and I found them and I burrowed away in the roots of the tree until I found a little door. And I went through the little door and within the little door was a little wooden cave. And in the corner of the cave was the baby of statistics, notoriously grumpy. But I managed to film our interaction. Anova is robust. <laughs> <laughs> But it's okay, because there are lots of robust methods that we can apply. So again, the question is, do psychologists apply them? Well, uh, this is a very crude bit of data scraping that I did from Scopus. So it's over a million psychology articles. And this was just looking in the abstracts for whether they use phrases like trimmed mean bootstrap, whether they cited Wilcox's book, uh, and for terms like robust regression and robust anno. So bearing in mind, I reckon about 70% of psychology data probably <laughs> ought to require a robust model to be uh, fitted to it. So we'd expect you know, these to sum to something like sort of 70%. You can see, actually, again, this is going to way, way, way underestimate. But very crudely, the, the numbers are minuscule. People are just not applying these robust methods anywhere near as much as they should be. The final thing I want to say is, um, given that we're at a BPS event, is as BPS members and psychologists, we are bound by the code of conduct. And there's a few things in the code of conduct that are particularly interesting. First is we should practice within the boundaries of our competence. Now, I don't know about you, but I regularly am faced with data uh, challenges where I feel I might be at the boundaries of my confidence. And I'm someone who probably takes more of an interest in statistics than a lot of uh, people. We are also supposed to seek consultation and supervision in situations where we feel beyond our... Uh, expertise, which, you know, well, as Richard, who's talking later, will tell you, I have bugged him quite a lot about Bayesian stuff over the last few years, um, but that's something we should be doing. And in my experience, every methodologist I've ever emailed with some idiotic question, uh, they've always been incredibly nice to me and given me lots of their time to explain things. Uh, and we should remain aware and acknowledge the limits of the methods that we use. So, will an independent analyst help with any of this? Again, just summarising everything we've been through. Yes, I think they do. They help with all these researcher degrees of freedom. They help with objectivity. And self-evidently, they help with competence because it's completely unrealistic to expect someone who's uh, you know, an expert in a field of psychology to also be a world expert in statistics, with the exception of Richard and EJ, obviously. Um, or, if you don't have <laughs> someone to consult, you can buy an excellent book. OK. What I haven't said is anything about how we might implement that, but I'm hoping there might be some questions that we can talk about during the discussion around that. Uh, otherwise, thank you very, very much for your attention and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.